May 6th. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights. Tonight, a crab people, time travel. Let's do this. So, uh, hey, Scott, what's a Grecian urn? Uh, an amphora? About 25 cents an hour these days. Ooh. Oh. Do they really? Because, I mean... <laughs> no, that was just a FARC headline, and, you know, the radio DJ thing to do is to steal a headline I mean, from FARC. Just, I mean, just because they have economics problems, I don't think that they're... Like their wages are the problem. I think that the government is the problem, right? Well, it's the, got too much debt. It's got not enough tax revenue. It's well, the problem's complicated. But what I would boil it down to, and I'm by no means, you know, Wall Street job aside, I'm by no means a professional. Yeah, you in make financial sure that, markets. Yeah, okay, you learn a lot about this stuff just being around people who do it. But your job is make sure the server doesn't crash. Well, <laughs> actually, no, I have I have much bigger responsibilities than that now. Ooh. I got promoted a while ago. Oh shit! Yeah. So now you have to make sure two servers don't crash. <laughs> 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 but all that aside, I mean, what that situation basically comes down to is that imagine, you know, how our like New York State, the government, again, run out of money and budget's not done. So, you know, periodically in America, we'll have things shut down like, oh, we're out of money. We're shutting everything down. But well, nothing- that's no, usually things shut down when states can't pass their budgets. So the state doesn't pass a budget. The date goes past. So the deadline is gone. And now they, you know, they can't allocate money to anything. So they turn. So everyone goes home and no one, they can't spend any money on anything except emergency well, services. I guess the point I was making that at least when I was a kid, this happened in Michigan a few times, but they never actually shut anything down. Basically, the state's out of money and it didn't mean anything. And part of the reason why it doesn't mean anything is that with credit, we can do deficit spending. So if there is a problem, you can always just spend the money and deal with it later. Mm -hmm. And that works pretty well. But imagine if one day, like if tomorrow, the federal government was told by someone who had the power to tell them things, you can't borrow any money for the next few years, starting right now. So we had to then pay for everything we did with cash. Mm. And we don't have enough cash. So Mm. what do we do? You don't get everything you want. (laughs) So the real tricky part is that in Greece... Basically, it's kind of a situation of the ant and the grasshopper where Germany... What? (laughs) You know the old parable? No. Okay, never mind then. All right. This doesn't work, obviously, the analogy. (laughs) So it's the analogy... The lion and the mouse, he's pulling the thorn out of his paw. The hobo and the guy who is fiscally responsible. (laughs) (laughs) The hobo begs on the street and the fiscally responsible guy goes home and plays some video games. But basically... Today, you know, I saw you guys playing that stock market game and someone was like, oh, no, Greece passed the thing and now the stock market collapsed. That is so far from the truth. So already there's riots going on in the street in Greece. I mean, you know, we have the. Yeah, well, you know, we always talk about how the reason we can't get anyone to riot is because there's bread. And as long as they have bread and circuses, guess what? Greece, no more bread. Well, they're running out of circuses, too, if that pool thing. Oh, well, no, they got plenty of circuses. <laughs> Not just... enough pools. Bread, circuses, and pools, apparently. <laughs> Plus, you know, World Cup's coming. That's plenty of circuses for them. <laughs> Unless they lose. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it doesn't matter. But basically, it, it was sad. I mean, it, it's one thing to work in the financial sector. It's another thing to see the kind of visceral, you know, people died in Greece in riots and attacks on banks because of the economic situation. Uh, my opinions and all that aside... The stock market dropped, the Dow at least, dropped 900 and something points in the course of like a minute. Yep. So I'm sitting at work, you know, things are going pretty pretty fine, and then I see a little news thing pops up that says Greece passes austerity bill. And I'm like, huh, I wonder how that's going to affect the... And then I look up and I see interspersed with CNBC saying like, stock market collapsing, oh my god. And they're like, they're all panicking. And interspersed with this in the background is scenes of further rioting in Greece. And then I look at it and all my market days exploding, like the book like froze on my laptop. I couldn't, I couldn't even like see what was going on in the market. So I'm trying to like make sure all our systems are handling this okay. And, and the market's dropping faster than the news can even report. I see the news saying like it's dropped 400 points and I'm looking at the real market data. It's like minus 800. It's like at 800 and still <laughs> going down. We almost hit the circuit breaker. What's the circuit breaker? There's a circuit breaker in the stock market that basically says if you drop more than X percent and all these other conditions... Markets stop because we got to figure out what's going on. We got kind of close to that. Mm. But basically what happened now, this is all up in the air and this is not I don't speak on behalf of any company of any entity other than myself and my personal guess and opinion. And CNBC has actually reported something similar, but it may well have been that basically there was a print 
That when someone, whenever you buy stock, there's a print in the tape. You know the ticker tape. Is the, is the says, tape still exists somewhere? Yeah, but no one has a physical tip, ticker tape. Oh, okay. I found on Craigslist a ticker tape machine. Could you hook it up and make it print out what it's supposed to print out for reels? Probably. <laughs> there might it might print too fast. It might break. <laughs> but I thought about buying it when we were in Beacon because it was in the city. I could see if it's still there. Mm. Imagine if we had a ticker tape machine. Hook That's all the, you. Hook it up to the Arduino. That's all you. Eh? Anyway. As best as anyone on CNBC has been able to report, it was basically a glitch. And what happened was somewhere uh, along the line, someone... Uh, the internet's saying it wasn't a glitch, though. Well, not a glitch in, like, the stock market or in the systems, but there was some sort of print that was way outside of what anyone would have expected. And because of that, you know, people treated it as legitimate, and it's possible that automatic systems and then humans in that fraction of a second made very poor decisions because of that. And started selling when they probably wouldn't have wanted to sell. So the market dropped 900 points, then immediately went all the way back up as everyone, you know, rebought in or fixed everything. And there was, it was crazy. I'm sitting there, everyone's panicking, there's yelling going around, there's yelling on the TV, and on the TV behind the yelling is riots and fireballs and riot police in the streets. It's awesome. That and, thing is, right? So that all happened. And so all this happens, and then, you know, finally it's starting to calm down. And I look in the Geek Nights forum, and I see one of you guys playing that game, basically like, I think the stock market's going down. Oh, no. I wonder if it was because of Greece. <laughs> but meanwhile, right, it's like all that crazy shit happens, but it's like, you know, sun, his sun's up, right? I mean, I, you know, everyone's driving around. I biked home. Well, people are driving around here. I mean, Greece, things aren't doing so well. No, but I mean, it's like... How can you tell that if that happens and it's not like the end, how can you tell when it's the end? Well, because it went back up. <laughs> okay. Even if it had So wait, so what if it's the circuit breaker, right? So basically the market closes. It's the, same then, as, the same as like the bell ringing, right? Kind of, yeah. So do all the exchanges have the same circuit breaker? Uh, that I'm not 100% sure on. Anyway. Basically, you know, as it was dropping, I'm talking, I'm looking at my coworkers, we're debating... So if the circuit breaker is hit, how exactly should we handle this? And do it this way, do it this way? You get to go home, right? I mean, the market closes, go home. You know, as much as I wish, I would be the one to be there to deal with that bullshit. Right. So the thing is, right, okay, so let's say you hit the circuit breaker, and the next day you open the market again. Well, the idea, is that, the idea is that something's going on, and it's probably not good. So let's stop and give everyone time to cool down, to assess. Basically, give everyone time to Scott Johnson it in a choir. Mm. And count all. But what the ducks. if everyone counts all the ducks and there's like five ducks and there's supposed to be five million ducks? Well, then the market has discovered a problem and now we got to deal with that. <laughs> I mean, if you only actually what if the, had, what if the only answer is it's it's gonna go down like all the way? If like, you only actually had five ducks in the first place and you've been just acting like you had more ducks all this time, isn't that what the whole world's been doing for you know a hundred years? <laughs> It's a little more complicated than that. I don't know. That's what it seems like to me. The gist of this is I had an exciting day at work. All right. Uh, I got nothing. It's Thursday. We, we couldn't decide what to do the show on even. Yeah. It's, Scott had uh, a good idea, and we'll probably do it in the future. Should we tell him what this idea is? It's not necessary. You don't want to, you want to keep it a secret? Because I think it'll be a it's good show. It's not a secret. We don't need to, you know, we never really talk about shows in advance. Plus, when nah. we do, right, it, it could result in shit talking. So let's not. It could. But unless we always preface things by saying we may, we might, we intend. Eh, it's not necessary. <laughs> we desire to. Anyway. There is a news I want to talk about. Really? Yeah, I don't want to talk about it a lot, but I want to take this not from the technological side. I mean, this is basically a Monday-style news that there's... An... So here's the deal. We have brain scan machines now that can detect fairly accurately whether or not someone is lying on the spot. Like, it can tell with a reasonable degree of certainty whether or not a person is fabricating the verbal data that they're expelling to you. Mm -hmm. Now, it's not perfect yet. We shouldn't use this in courts because it's it's like lie detectors. It's still it's not. We can't. This you is can't, not ninety nine point nine percent. Send someone. You can't lock someone up forever based on what a machine says. It's not. It's not cool. Well, well, well. So what if we have a machine that recorded video of a dude stabbing another dude to death? That's okay. But that's just a machine telling us something. Not really. How, what do you mean? What's different? <laughs> What's different? Yeah. 
Because even though we have fMRIs and stuff, that's not, you know, people's brains, right, are not video cameras. Video cameras are infallible. A brain recording memory, even if you can read the memory out of the brain, it's not exactly what the person saw. Oh, but saw. we're not reading the memory. We're, this is the, the very specific case here is the idea that what if you can tell 100% whether or not a person right now is fabricating what they're telling to you? What? But the, here's the thing, right? Is it the same... What if I think I'm lying, but I'm not? Does it still look the same? Well, if you think you're lying and you're not, then that means that you your intent is still to lie. You just happen to have accidentally told the truth. Yeah. So now you're gonna. So now what do you? You don't know what to think, right? So well, what no, if? But what if you could have a meter that basically says this person is guaranteed right now? We can prove with science is in whatever he is saying. He is intending to deceive. What? How? What percentage is oh, let, on let's this? Let's say it's a hundred. Let's say we get a hundred somehow. It's a hundred. So that, let's just say for the purposes okay. of a thought experiment. So you know that they're intending to deceive. You still have no idea what the truth is. You haven't yeah, learned anything. But you, but is it admissible? You, would you say in a court if someone is testifying like right now before Congress or before a court, they're testifying, and this machine says one hundred percent the last two sentences that they spoke, regardless of the veracity of these sentences, were spoken with the clear intent to deceive the listeners. Well, you you couldn't say for sure whether those two sentences are true or false, but what you could do Which is, is you, you, could I just, just you could just strike those two sentences from the record and, and leave it at that. So here's you could the, be like, okay, those two sentences are not admissible in the court. End of, you know. So here's the, here's the interesting thing that happened. A judge in Brooklyn has excluded fMRIs from trials. Okay. Now, it did not set a precedent because of the way he did it. But all that aside, the interesting part is that he did not argue that it wasn't accurate enough or that it's ambiguous or anything like that. You know, this is the conversation we could argue about forever. Mm -hmm. The reason he didn't let it go is, quote, juries are supposed to decide the credibility of witnesses. And fMRI lie detection, even if it could be proven completely accurate, infringes on that right. Uh-huh. I don't know how I feel about that at all. I don't know either. The idea that... You're saying that that the the jur like we're, if we have a machine that can determine an actual truth verifiably, and he you know he said you know irrespective of yeah isn't the purpose of the jury is because we can't find the truth so we need a jury of peers to you know discover it but what if there is a way to beyond reasonable doubt just scientifically determine the truth for reals like let's say we have you know a magic oracle that actually works and let us look at yep. any you know or a quantum wormhole that a machine that lets us watch the past yeah so or watch exactly the words someone's thinking in their head you know crazy future science yeah then what do you need a jury for it's you don't need one well anymore. i think you still need a jury to look at that evidence and you have i don't know i feel like the idea of a jury of peers is still important in the idea that even if we're in some far future society if we ever use machines that are above beyond us or before us you know, in terms of an AI that's smarter than us or a machine that's not as smart as us or smart in a different way. I feel like at least one other of us has to agree with what the machine did before we decide to enact justice. The thing is that the machine can um, do that. The machine can also probably control the person that is uh, the, the person that's supposed to it's agree to say, or disagree just, with it. It's interesting that this judge has basically sidestepped all the practical arguments of, well, is it really accurate? What does it really tell us? And said straight up, we shouldn't use machines like this because it infringes on the jury's rights to figure it out for themselves. Mm -hmm. and I don't know. I think it's interesting, and I don't know how I feel about there that. There was an interesting thing that I read about uh, they did something. I don't know where it was, but basically they compared rational jurists to non-rational jurists. I don't know how they determined who was a rational person. I who, saw that. And who wasn't. But apparently rational people decide cases rationally, gasp, and non-rational people decide cases was that the emotionally, same, was gasp, Because that I saw another sense. study where they showed that, because they segregated jurors, again, between emotional and rational, and they found that, overwhelmingly so, irrational or emotional jurors would pretty much say guilty or innocent based on how attractive the person was. Yeah, I think that was the article there. Yeah. And so it's like, so they were like, look, we have to only have rational jurors. So it's like, aha, you'll have no jurors. Well, you know, the old James Randi anecdote. Almost everybody. What was the, the judge said to the, to the lawyers who didn't know who James, James Randi was? He said, that man there will evaluate the facts in an empirical manner and make a decision based solely on the veracity of the, you know, whatever. Uh, yep. It'll make a decision and then the lawyers based were like, solely on the no. evidence. Hell no. <laughs> and then he was not on the jury.
<laughs> so yeah, but I think this was in a non-U.S. Uh, situation. I think it might have yeah. been in Ireland or the U.K. or something. I don't know. I mean, I think in the end, or Scotland. It, my my personal feelings. I don't know the difference. You know, it's Thursday. I don't really want to get into the news any further, but I'm of the mind that regardless of how we define in law, like what, pardon me, what the purposes of juries are, what the purpose of law is, what justice is. I feel like there should be a stated goal in all in our entire legal system that basically forces everyone to accept truth above all other circumstances. Mm -hmm. Like if something can be proven, like proven beyond a beyond any reason, they already have that. (laughs) It's called beyond a reasonable doubt. Well, beyond a reasonable doubt or beyond a shadow of a doubt. Well, beyond a shadow of a doubt is is also beyond a reasonable doubt. Actually, multiple lawyers have told me that those are actually two different circumstances. Uh-huh. That beyond a reasonable doubt is, for example, uh, yeah, it's possible that you didn't do it. If there is a DNA clone of you out there that was taken from, you know, when you were born, grown in a lab, trained, and dropped from the sky into this facility, you know, something like that. That's not a reasonable doubt. No. But shadow of a doubt is that's also not possible. <laughs> Okay. I don't know. I thought it was interesting. Do you have anything interesting? No. Nothing on this Thursday? This fine summer day? I don't know. Uh, It's not summer yet. It's Uh, summer. No, I'm pretty sure. It's it's like 80 degrees out there. It's summer. I'm pretty sure it's spring still. The Uh, leaves are summer green. They're no longer spring green. I don't know. I went to work, came home, playing Street Fighter, you know. I almost bought an Xbox. Any second, I'm just going to go, buy an Xbox. And then you're going to regret it. You're not going to play Street Fighter. Maybe, yeah, we'll you should, maybe you should play some Street Fighter to decide. I was. They... I was playing some Street Fighter last night at the Muse Games game night. Street Fighter, Super Street Fighter 4? Yeah. And so... With, well, with uh, actually a, a bigger stick from the one you had mm. that Conrad brought. Oh, he probably, I think he has like a like a Hori uh, stick. So, I kicked some ass. Uh, yeah, against who? Against people who sucked. <laughs> Basically, I used my Street Fighter 2 non- pre-gnosis skills. So my, my completely non-Gnostic All ability. your Street Fighter 2 stuff still works. There's just a whole bunch of extra stuff on top of it. But any character from Street Fighter 2, you could just play as if it's Street Fighter 2. I actually wish they would include like Street Fighter 2 mode, where you can only use Street Fighter 2 characters, and they, they work exactly the way they worked in Street Fighter 2. Or at least Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo. Because uh-huh. every character from Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo is in there. So against people who also do not know the Gnosis, and also who didn't really play Street Fighter back in the day... I can just M Bison and just slide kick, slide kick, slide kick, slide kick, slide kick, slide kick until they die. Yeah, the slide kick. If uh, you it's know, super dangerous, I play. I play as M Bison all the time. That's my. I guy. played one good person, and I was like slide kick. He's like punch to the nuts. You're done. Yeah, punch to the nuts. The side to slide kick is basically the least safe move in the that you can possibly do as M Bison. Ba- you basically they can block it low and then start a combo on you. Yeah, they can do an uppercut against even though you're low. They can basically hit jump and hit you while you're doing it and then start a combo. They can block it with a focus attack and then crumple you and then make a combo. It's basically <laughs> the weakest, most unsafe possible move you can do is the slide. You know, and I only throw out the slide when it's like completely, completely safe to do the slide, and there's absolutely no chance. That, and it's so rare that that happens. The thing is, I have a reflex to do the slide when I shouldn't, or I accidentally do the slide. So I gotta like avoid the slide. Basically, nah. you know, and it's sort of annoying too because you're M Bison, you want to do a low kick. You got to do the low medium kick, which is great because it has a great reach on it. And also the standing medium kick has a great forward reach, you know. Uh, but if you accidentally push the other one, you can do the stupid slide. And you're like, oh, fuck. And then the guy blocks it and show you can do. And then you land on the ground and you stand up and he gets you when you're trying to stand up. And then it's a disaster. So anyway, we got nothing on this Thursday day. So things of the day. Hmm, thing of the day. All right, so check this out. You ready? I'm checking. Einfisch, Zweifisch, Reuterfisch, Blairfisch. Uh, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. Yeah, apparently this is a Yiddish translation of one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. <laughs> what gets better than that, right? I mean, Yiddish is awesome, but this is like Dr. Seuss Yiddish. I don't know. Can you Can you really beat that? I don't think you can beat that. I think I can beat that with the fact that we can now watch the original Metropolis uncut. Oh, shit. Oh, shit, indeed. Apparently, Guy had it for a long time. You know, everyone probably knows the whole story of Metropolis and how we lost it. And, you know, it was, re- it was shown and people hated it because it was too, like, obtuse. So they cut out huge chunks of the movie. And then they were lost and destroyed. And 
Basically, they're showing it in theaters now. They found it. They've got the whole thing. It'll be on DVD soon. Uh, I'm going to find out where it's playing in New York City, and maybe we'll go see it, though it's like three hours long. That's fun. <laughs> but uh, cool things to note. One, there's an entire like subplot. Well, actually, there's multiple subplots that were completely cut out involving the Thin Man, and he looks pretty good in these shots. Watch, we go to see this, and it's just uh, Rintaro's and, you know, <laughs> Ultimo's Metropolis. Like, we found <laughs> it! It's like, no, you didn't. Well, the really interesting thing is that uh, I'm going to quote one of the guys who restored it and who worked with this project a lot, who has seen all the real Metropolis now. Uh, quote, it is no longer a science fiction film. Mm -hmm. The balance of the story has been given back. It's now a film that encompasses many, many genres, an epic about conflicts that are ages old. The science fiction disguise is now very, very thin. Uh Uh-huh. I really look forward to seeing this. Have you watched any other Fritz Lang movies like uh, M or anything like that? I've seen M. Ah, so great. Yeah. Anyway. All right, so... So the we- meta minute that you forgot about. Oh, snap. Oh, I forgot. Cosmos is the book. Project Dorf is the coding club project. <laughs> um, I don't know. Don't have much else. Kineticon Not- is coming. Kineticon's coming up. Uh, if you really want to do a panel, you better get it to me like today or tomorrow because I'm not really taking any more submissions. I don't know. Do we have enough to fill the schedule? I think so. All right. Um, um, I don't know. I don't have any more metas. Nothing at all? No. Oh. Uh, okay. So, we couldn't think of an idea for the show, so we went. Actually, Emily will be happy. She made like a spreadsheet on Google Docs or a document on Google Docs that has... Basically, she compiled all the suggestions from the forum thread into one document. So I actually looked at it for once. And I'm like, oh, boring, boring, boring. And then I see this one suggestion for time travel. And I'm like, huh. oh, you know, there was that reason Stephen Hawking thing about time travel. Maybe this will be an okay-ish show. So let's see what's up. I'll go straight up. I have a, a, a prediction about why he is saying the things that he's saying now suddenly. Because remember, just a little while ago, he came out and he was like, yeah, if aliens find us, they'll probably kill us. We should really be hiding until we're more advanced. Yeah, probably. Because yeah. any well, I think the thing is, is that if you're in a situation right where you cannot achieve interstellar travel, and there are any alien for any aliens to meet you, they do know interstellar travel. Therefore, right, uh, they are automatically guaranteed to be more advanced than you. But if you have interstellar travel, then you don't really have any other measurement, you know, to determine if aliens are more or less advanced than you are until you meet them. So. Until you are able to meet aliens, you should not encourage aliens to meet you. Otherwise, you're guaranteed to have the lower hand. Now, at the same time, he's definitely relying, in this case, on human experience. I mean, he uses the Christopher Columbus example. That's the problem everyone has. Well, you know? we, you know, we're this this puddle is perfectly shaped to the space I found it in. It must have been <laughs> created that way. Duh. <laughs> the anthropic principle and such. But it's hard to say because in, in all of the experiences we've ever had, both with humans and with animals and plants and everything, if a stronger or more advanced anything comes into contact with a weaker one, it pretty much just takes it over. Yep. So why risk it? You know, it's the most likely outcome. But what you know, I think, it's the same universe, right? What the I same... think, Haw- Mr. Hawking is incredibly smart. No, Dr. Hawking. no, really. No, no. He, he's a genius. He's one of the most the Are smartest you sure? human beings. He doesn't look so smart to me. I mean, he can't even talk, dude. To ever <laughs> live. He can sing. I know. <laughs> I'm just... <laughs> but I think what he's doing right now is making himself future-proof. I don't think he's had any major insights, at least in this front. Like, I don't think he was sitting there one day, he's like, wait a minute, time travel's possible, and here's why. I think what he's thinking is that we're probably going to figure something out at some point in the next 100,000 years. (laughs) If I say time travel is not possible, which is likely that it's not possible, at least in a way that we could understand or take advantage of, and someone does something that is akin to time travel... I'll be in the history book says, yeah, he was mostly right, but we proved him wrong on this. If I just say it's possible someday, if it's never possible, no one will ever call me on it. And if we find out it's possible, I'll be a visionary. Eh, I think he's already a visionary. I don't think he, is, he, he really is, but, needs, but I, I don't know, think he really needs that. But look at the way he writes, the kind of person he is. I would bet a lot that he's future proofing himself with that, that time travel thing. 
I don't know. I think what he's actually doing, right, which is a much more Occam's Razor uh, idea, is that, you know, he's so good at explaining advanced physics in ways that just even a normal person can sort of understand the concept, you know? And that's, if you read his books, the ones that are, you know, meant for mass consumption, that's what you're going to get. You're going to get, like, crazy astrophysics that, that you can understand. Um, the way is that people are less interested in science, technology, and whatever, and the approach he's taking is to say sort of things, you know, about stuff that people care about. If he talks about time travel and aliens, people are going to pay attention to that, even normal people. So what he can do is he can talk about time travel and aliens, and he's sort of trying to get people to care about science and physics and whatever, which, you know, when normal people don't care right now as much. And he's, you know, it's a, it's a good strategy to bring people back into it. You know, maybe... He's going to sell some books and, may, you know, that's fine. That's, you know, selfish interest. But then maybe one of those people will read the book and maybe one of those people will become more science minded and then the world will be better because we'll have one more sciencey person, you know? Well, that Whereas is one of the if he just always talked in his hardcore physics way, normal people wouldn't give a crap. Well, in general, we need, we need another Carl Sagan. Carl Sagan got an entire generation of scientists to care about science. And Cosmo still holds up, but... I feel like with modern internet kids, we need like a new, a modern, like a Twitter slash 4chan cosmos. Uh huh. I don't know if it's possible, but we need, we really do need to get people excited about science because kids who at least are in any way skeptical and rational and reasonable, or at least are confronted with the fact that there's beauty in the world that is scientific, you know, deconstructing the rainbow. Is a rainbow less beautiful if you know how it works? I think that would go a long way to fight religious extremism and the such in the world. I mean, if you look at some of the things he said, too, it's like he's like, OK, so time travel. So let's say you had a train and the trainer went around the world so fast. So if it went around the world this fast, time would actually slow down on the train. So if you looked at the train, the people would be going real slow. And he's like, well, what if a girl, you know, the train is going almost the speed of light. And then a girl is on the train and she starts running really fast. Isn't she going to get past the speed of light and break the rules? It's well, like, we, we already it's know like, that. No, because the time will slow down for her even more. So the other people on the train will be looking at her going real slow motion compared to them. And basically, you know, they'll get... Uh, uh, older as she doesn't get older and, relativity you know? is just like it amazes me the uh, this whole idea that there's kind of the it's like this it's not a speed limit it's more like it's kind of the, the thing you'd see in a video game engine like well, i think no the, object can be moving faster than this this number that's the biggest speed i can well, deal the with thing in my that's engine. just so weird is that it's like you know the faster you move just in space right like take it just walking right the more the faster i walk and move around. But see, you're saying then, walking and moving. Yeah, but that it, didn't, that means you're moving. You're not just moving in space. You're also moving in time. Right. But if like if I move around, then like the 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 moving in the time, the amount of movement I have in time is changes based on the amount of movement in space. If I move across a lot of space, you know, then I move across less more time. Ah, that's crazy. Well, I mean, even think now we're hurtling. But it's totally true. We're hurtling in all these different directions at crazy speeds. You know, Earth is moving through the galaxy and the galaxy's flying out from the center of the Big Bang. And there's other galaxies out there moving faster than us. We'll never be able to catch them. Yep. So what do you think would happen if you had a wormhole that looked at us five minutes ago and we shot ourselves from the future? Uh, it can't happen. Oh, why not? What if there's a wormhole to the past? Well, actually, I was reading the other day, there was some guy wrote a Dr. Seussian <laughs> parable about uh, the halting problem yep. you know, of computer science. And basically, the problem is, could you write a computer program that would detect when another computer program would halt? Right? Like, so, it basically, an infinite loop detector. Could you de- write an infinite loop detector? And the thing is, okay... So I'll take this infinite loop detector and I'll run it against itself. Will there be an infinite loop in the infinite loop detector? And basically, if there is an infinite loop in the infinite loop detector, then the infinite loop detector will say yes. But then if the infinite loop detector says yes, then there is no infinite loop in the infinite loop detector. It has to say no, no, no. But then if it says no, then there will be an infinite loop. So it it doesn't work, right? So basically... You know, whenever there's a paradox, what it means is not that, oh, my God, this is a crazy paradox. What it means is that it's not possible, right? You cannot write an infinite loop detector. That's the answer, right? Because writing one would be a paradox. Therefore, time travel is the same thing. You cannot go back in time and kill yourself and have it actually kill yourself, you know, because that would be a paradox. Therefore, it can't happen. 
right? It just it couldn't happen. There would it, it's just not possible. You know, people seem to think that like paradoxes are this thing that happens, and then when they happen, shit gets fucked up. Oh my gosh, no paradoxes. If there's a paradox, that means that that is a scenario that can never come to be. No matter what, that will never happen. Of course, at the same time, that's still limited by our understanding and ideas of the universe. But it's true. That's that's just how it is. Well, no. It's math. It, I well, mean, but ma- does math describe the world perfectly? Has it failed yet? Sometimes, but usually <laughs> just because we don't have we have an imperfect understanding. Math always works. All the correct math is always correct. <laughs> <laughs> Only the wrong math is wrong. That's really the interesting thing mm-hmm. that math we can use it perfectly to describe theoreticals, but in the real world it will theoretically work. We just can't measure things closely enough to figure out if it works 100%. And you know that when you measure something you modify, it, right? Yeah, well, because what's even measurement? I mean, look at the world around us that we see. It's just electrons banging off of what is effectively empty space. There's more empty space in me than there is me. Yep. So time travel. Uh, Well, do we want to talk about, like, you know... Let's talk about movie time travel Do you want to talk about not real time travel, or do you want to talk about, you know, going really fast so that we can go to the future time travel? I remember a long time ago, time travel's easy. Here we go. All right. I've gone about 10 seconds. (laughs) Me too. (laughs) <laughs> One second per second into wait, the future. Wait, you're going up at different speeds now. Are you really? I'm moving around. I'm also, but you know, is that really? Does that count? Yeah. I mean, is that enough to count? I'm moving away from you right now. Okay. I, I continue to move away from you. That matters because you're not moving, and I am. Does it? Is that really enough? I mean, because I mean, I'm I'm moving a little bit. But wouldn't not it have to have still. some effect? Because if something if something has zero effect, then it doesn't exist effectively. I don't know. Ah, uh, we're not physicists. Timo's probably just banging his head against the desk, That's right. listening to this whole show. Yeah, how much do you have to like move, like relative to the other person? I don't. Know. I'm moving relative to you, but I'm also kind of moving. I yeah. don't know. But I'm the one bearing the burden of acceleration. We'll see. Whatever. Well, we already saw. So you want to talk about some not real time travels, like you Terminator, know. or what do you think? What should you do first, Terminator or Back to the Future? I don't know. I think Terminator is actually kind of better than Back to the Future I think in terms of time traveling. Terminator works, but it only works for the same reason that Final Fantasy One works: time loop. Mm-hmm. It, you know, I read someone wrote a very long essay. I don't know if I could ever find it again, but they basically kind of proved logically, but not mathematically or anything, that the Terminator One and Two forget all those other abortions work as a realistic idea of time travel if it were possible because they're self consistent in that. You know, the problem you'd think of is, so if you go into the past and prevent Skynet from forming, then Skynet wouldn't form. And you wouldn't know to send someone into the past to prevent Skynet from forming, Mm -hmm. which is true. But what could happen is, so you, Skynet is formed. You send someone into the past to stop Skynet from forming. Skynet sends someone into the past to, you know, and you have this fight. If you win, the future happens, and then you didn't send someone back, but you've altered the timeline slightly regardless. So basically, you keep looping through these the pseudo same series of events, twelve monkeys style, and every time it's a little different. And eventually, you reach in you know a million loops out a situation where someone from the future came to the past, prevented Skynet from forming, but at the same time ensured a situation would come to pass to where in the future they would know to send someone back to prevent a future that did not actually ever occur. So but you, basically, the so the final history would it be... It might be someone went back into the past, It might but they be like, listen, listen, you know, where everyone's just chilling around, right? And there's some crazy scientist, and he's like, look, I know we're living in this paradise, guys, right? But in order for this paradise to work, someone has to go back into the past and make this happen. We right? don't know Otherwise, why. Right? We, don't, we can't know why. We can't understand how or why. Why why couldn't you know why? Why, Because this Skynet thing would have been formed if we don't go into the past now. It's possible. Why can't you know why? why, I don't understand why knowing why Well, the trouble is that, you know, if you follow this time loop idea, then every time you go back, kind of the future you came from never came to pass. So you never went back. So Mm -hmm. it kind of recurses back to before anyone time traveled. Mm -hmm. So without that future existing, you know, Chrono Trigger had the same idea. That's why they made Chrono Cross and Radical Dreamers. You know what? Some world had to have had Lavos happen for the people in this world to know to go stop Lavos. Mm. Or 12 Monkeys actually did it very similarly. I don't want to talk about that movie because I don't want to spoil it for anyone who hasn't seen it. But awesome Bruce Willis movie that a lot of people haven't seen, stupidly. I don't even know what it is. Really? Until just now. You've really never seen 12 Monkeys? What, tw- how many monkeys? Well, thir- 12. <laughs> how come not 13 monkeys? Well, that's 13 ghosts. 
When, when the hell's 13 Ghosts? You've never seen 13 Ghosts. Have Famous I, old horror movie. 10 Zombies? 14 uh, no, Vampires? Just, thir- just 13. <laughs> 12 Monkeys and 13 Ghosts. <laughs> $20? I, I think 13 Ghosts is a Vincent Price movie. I don't actually remember. I'm not, you know, a good movie Hello, person. Hello, internet. I will look that up right now. I already got it. I think it was remade, though, so don't look at wow, the stupid remake. Wow, it's one three en Ghosts, 2001. No, that's a, that's a shitty remake. Eh, shitty remake. 13 Ghosts, 1960. That might also be William a remake. William Castle. I think it's got, that's also... It's got five. No, no, that's the one. Never mind. That's more recent than I thought it was, but yeah, that's it. It doesn't have the greatest rating in the world. It's a good movie, though. It says 5.9 out of 10 on the IMDb's. It's good. The 13 ghosts at the end are hilarious. It's fun to be scared by 13 ghosts. A family inherits what proves to be a haunted house, but a special pair of goggles. Put the glasses on! (laughs) (laughs) They can see the ghosts in the uh, the haunted house. Okay. Big deal. Yeah, it's a good plot. Horror movie. I'd rather watch Seventh Guest. Seventh Guest? Or what about The 11th Hour? Well, you know, Seventh Guest is very similar to They Were 11. It is. And The 11th Hour is basically the sequel to The Seventh Guest. Yep. Oh, shit. Wow, so, <laughs> synchronicity there. <laughs> right. What were we talking about? Do you want to hear some synchronicity? It was, uh, I was riding my bike home, and it, the clock said 519, and then I pushed the button, and I think the odometer was at like 51.9 miles or whatever, you know. You know what? Right now, it's 653. And yesterday, at the same time, it was also 6.53. Oh, shit. Oh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> you fucking with me, man. That can't be true. <laughs> you really haven't seen 12 Monkeys. I can't get over this. I even know that. You, you didn't see The Usual Suspects when I met you. Yeah, back then. You still then, haven't seen Dark City. That movie is not as good as 12 Monkeys. I don't think you understand. Dark City is like the greatest. No, the Usual Suspects is not as good as 12 Monkeys. What? You're fucked up in the head. Well, one, 12 Monkeys on IMDb is 8.1 out of 10. All right. So what's uh, Usual Suspects on IMDb? I don't know. Let me look. Since we're talking about movies. We can just b- well, burn this Thursday show on whatever we got. The Usual Suspects is... From 1995, 8.7. They're very similarly rated. What's the other one? 8.1. I told you. I was right. Very close. I got you by 0. 0.6. That is a non-insignificant uh, it's amount. It's tough, though, because this is, uh, Usual Suspects is a newer film. It's up 10% this week, but 12 Monkeys is down 6% this week. Why? I don't know. I have to log into the pro version to see. I'm not paying money. <laughs> okay. This is BS. Right. <laughs> Regardless, those are good time travel movies. No, not at all. They don't have any time traveling. 12 Monkeys? Oh, no. Usual suspects. <laughs> <sighs> so what about Back to the Future? I don't know. The, the, the back to time travel in Back to the Future, I always felt was sort of ham-fisted and not so great. It's like, okay, you have to go at 88 miles an hour? Okay, no, right? And then it's like, what, you can go to the future and the past, and you sort of disappear, and you can make paradoxes, and you, it's like, okay. See, at the same time, I think it works in the sense that... It makes a good movie, no, but it, it's not a good... Here's the way it works. If time... It's, time travel in Back to the Future is like computers in Summer Wars. Ah, Here's one thing I can say, though. The time travel in Back to the Future works if you consider the, the, the worldview that every possible you know, instance spawns a million, you know, every different possible universe. So this follows one universe, where in that universe we follow the timeline of this one guy, what time travels. So he doesn't go to different universes when he time travels, only the same one? Maybe he jumps universes, or maybe so his then jumping when- is that universe. Mm-hmm. Mm. Maybe. I mean, that explains the whole no free will thing. Every possible thing happens. He doesn't have any free will. He didn't make any decisions. We just watched the non-free will iteration through all those events, through that one universe, mm-hmm. which followed him. The thing is, the universe had a history, and then it had a different history. So no, it's it like didn't. It- had it, so it had dirt. If so you, if you graph it with this idea, the timeline goes, you know, Big Bang... All the way up to him going back in time. And then the history, just the next step is like you've got two timelines, you stick them behind each other. The next day is in the 50s. So the whole universe actually changes to the 50s. Yes. So instead, actually, that's not a bad view of time travel. Instead of you traveling in time, right? What you actually do is you basically rewind the whole universe. You're actually going forward in time always, but you're just rearranging all the atoms of the entire universe to be in a prior configuration, just like you're rewinding a videotape to start playing from an earlier point, right? So it is, 
you know, time is marching forward. It's, you know, but everything, all the atoms are being moved around to the way, you know, all the sub, every single particle and every, all the energy in the universe. The only thing is, you know what law of physics that breaks? Uh, which one? Entropies. You're basically undoing entropies when, well, you, go, unless, when you do that. No, because you could be injecting outside energy. Let's say you're in another universe and you're, you find a universe and you basically inject energy into it and control it to make it your own personal TV. Mm. Ah, that I don't know. Maybe I mean the idea. So you would. So what you would do is you'd have to create some entropy in one part of the universe because you know. But then you could rewind the rest of the universe as long. But as long as the end result was greater entropies. But by in doing so, when you played it forward, that added entropy. It would not play forward the same way it played forward before because that entropy is adding a new. Uh, element. That's also possibly one of the ways out of, you know, the front row crew for a while, we had this whole thing for all you listeners uh, understanding where we were arguing about free will ever since all the physics articles talking about how it's basically not possible for there to be free will. Probably not. Yeah. But basically there are, there's a small number of kind of philosophical or possible scientific escapes from that trap. And one of them is the idea that we theoretically cannot escape from our universe or interact with the outside. But free will could arise in a situation where the universe is 100% deterministic and going along a path, but then it's influenced from outside of the universe by something else. And we don't know what but the rules wouldn't are Wouldn't we out there. still not have free will? Therefore, it the is outside po- influence is actually just another force controlling our will. And even if it is a force that you know, is not a force that we can understand within our laws of physics. It's still a force we have no will full well, control over, what and it therefore would mean we still don't that, have free will. What it would mean is that external things could possibly have free will, and then they screw up the predetermined destiny of the universe that we're in. So they could screw it up in such a way as to give someone internally free will by kind of funneling energy But it would still give them. you an illusion of free will, because even though something could fuck up, right, it has to be, you know, a the the decision that is made has to be a product of a conscious decision in a human brain but right? well, well, what so if, if, what if? if the fuck up is because some guy from outside the universe comes and flicks me and makes me turn left instead of right you know i didn't decide to turn left or right that wasn't the cause the root cause has to be you know from an animal brain in order what for there if to be free will he pulls your you know the the total of your memories and consciousness out of the universe and instills it with free will from that point forward somehow. Uh, so now it is a self-moving body. Like, the decisions made, he replaces your brain with some material from the outside, and your consciousness resides outside or in this material, and has control, and basically can control the physicality of your body so, in that universe. So my brain is in another universe, but then there is some, you know, like, wormhole link between the other universe Maybe. and this universe, through which my brain can control my body. So no scientist would ever see the free will coming from my brain because all they would see was the brain in this universe, which looks like it's just doing stuff, but it's yep. actually receiving completely undetectable signals from a free will at another universe. And that so it appears to be having no free will of its own whatsoever, but the free will component is like in the hundredth dimension or some crazy fuck shit that we just made up. Well, I think there's only 11 dimensions according to Kaku. So it's in the 13th dimension with the, with the ghosts and the zombies and <laughs> the monkeys. In fact, no, this, all, our, all our consciousnesses, all our free wills are actually in the brains of 13 monkeys combined. And they're you know, another, someday, there's another universe which is monkeys. You know, I remember reading Hyperspace and he talked about how the fourth spatial dimension was probably bigger at some point. I, I'm paraphrasing from when I was a young kid, but it collapsed and we're basically in it and we can move within it, you know, strength theory and all that. But it's a cylinder and it's so small that no matter how far we move, we don't really move enough. Like, it's like we move around the cylinder so fast there's basically no difference between whatever position we're in in that universe or in that dimension. Mm-hmm. But if we start, like, imagine if we name and find stuff in all the dimensions. Like the 11th dimension, just dicks. <laughs> just everywhere, dicks. <laughs> It's possible. Well, it's already poking through 4chan. <laughs> right? <sighs> I think 4chan, I think, it, it, you know, wasn't that the fourth dimension? I mean, 4chan, isn't that? Well, th- if the fourth dimension is a cylinder, I mean, it's kind of a primordial phallus. Okay, that's enough of that. <laughs> All right, it's enough of that. Any other time travel movie we can kill some time with? I don't know. Is there any must other kill is, time, boy? You must cherish. Is it. there any other non-movie time travel discussion? Okay, let's pretend that movie science fiction time travel 
Which is totally for real. Which movie is time travel? Uh, do, anyone you want. Back right? to the Future is the easiest one. So what, I can just what, I can do whatever what, I want. What would you What would you do? Uh, well, maybe. What about Hyperion time travel? Pick whatever you want. Just what you know. You can pick any kind of time travel and do any kind of thing. What would you do? Honestly, my the, the, a fantasy of mine would be the ability to travel back in time, but in a non-interactive manner. Because that couldn't cause any paradoxes. If I could simply view the 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 sure you can do it. You can do whatever you want. You can you know you have a you have a scrying pool. You can watch all of history. Yeah, basically, I'd watch the Big Bang. Of course, I don't know where I'd watch it from. (laughs) (laughs) What could you? But I'd watch the pyramids being built. You know, see, oh, they did it in some obvious physics way. I I would also want to see some pyramids being because they're they're smart people. You know, I think it's pretty safe to say that any secret of history we would want to see, right? Yeah. You know, is there any secret of history you don't want to see? Uh, well, I don't want to see what happened to your mom last night again. Okay. <laughs> it's not exactly a secret of history. I mean, you know, you could watch great works being created, and you could, you know, recover things that were lost. Like, if there's a movie that was lost, like Metropolis. You just go just, watch it. You just go watch it and recover In the theater. it. Yeah. You know, something like that. That's easy to do. And then what I would do is I would take all the stuff, right? And I would take all the people that I care about, and I would go... Into the future or the past and also throughout space. And I'd find the best possible place and time to live. And that's the place that I would go. Well, clearly that's the 11th dimension. No, you know, it's like if I find out that like 100 years in the future in, you know, Spain or something, that there's like everything's perfect for like a period of 200 years, I'd be like, all right, let's go live our lives out in that time period in that place, you know, and that'll be it. And that's how I'd roll. I just, I feel like we might have the capability Probably not in our lifetimes, but I think at some point humans will have the ability to somehow read information from the past in some capacity. Maybe by, you know, if there's uh, books. Well, if there's no, if there's a perfect causal chain, you know, that whole idea, or maybe a near perfect causal chain, then theoretically you could, we could reconstruct the path backward from where you are now. The trouble is with entropy is that we currently don't have the ability to do that no. because of entropy. I mean, well, no, we can't because of that. Uh, maybe because of entropy, but also because of the information theory stuff that people are talking about. Where it's yep. like, okay, to simulate the universe, you would also need you need all the information of the universe, but you can't possibly hold all the information of the universe in the universe because, because if you could, be, you basically made it would be bigger than you can't do it. Or at best, the best you could do is make the universe an exact copy of it. Yeah, but you couldn't forward, make a copy of the universe in the universe because that would be require the entire universe and thus you could not make you know a copy of a scott within a scott because you basically have to use the entire scott to do it and then you would end up with the scott you started with what about a fat guy that already has enough room for a scott inside of him uh but then you're not that that would mean we need a second universe already that we would then transform to be a copy of our universe we only have one universe to work with maybe that's our way out of entropy is we when we get near the end we find a universe that's just formed and we send all our shit there I guess that could work. But, I mean, that's basically the same solution we have for everything, right? Oh, our country is burned down. Let's go to another one. Oh, our planet's burning down. Let's go to another one. Our universe is burned down. Let's go to another one. You know, yeah. that, that's not an interesting uh, solution. But it's probably the best solution. Maybe. Uh, what I else? mean, really, yeah. I just, you know, this goes back to that court thing. What if we had the capacity to basically turn on a camera at any point in history and just watch? Uh, we would turn on a camera at any point in history and watch. Yeah, and it'd really simplify having jury trials. Yeah, one thing that I think is interesting about at least the forward time travel that Stephen Hawking talks about, which is totally real, right, with relativity, is that, you know, we think, oh, we can't possibly achieve traveling, you know, far out to other stars and planets because it takes too fucking long. And it does take too fucking long. Like, if a spaceship took off now, then it would be like a zillion generations before they heard back from, you know, assuming that we they could even communicate over such great distances from the spaceship that reached Alpha Centauri or whatever the fuck you're Andromeda or who knows where the hell you're going, right? Like the Galaxy well, Express. we're heading for Venus. But the thing is, if you and can... still we stand tall. If you can get your spaceship to go fast enough, like us. close to the speed of light fast enough, right? It'll actually get you to pretty far away in a reasonable time as far as you're concerned because time is so, sl- you know, slowing down for you. Well, it still won't get... Because you're going so fast. The trouble is it still won't get you anywhere that there is to get because the, the, the closest thing anywhere outside of our solar system is so far away. Yeah, but I mean, if you're traveling close to the speed of light, it'll be a matter of like, you know... Hundreds of light years. Yeah, so hundreds of years... 
right? You will get there. I think more interesting is, you know, Hyperion talked about this. Phoenix talked about this is that we can use forward time travel to create kind of wealths of knowledge and elder wisdom. I mean, how many stories are there now of the idea that you've got a group of elders who come to the earth, give a bunch of decisions and then fly up into a spaceship and circle the earth once very fast, you know, basically travel forward in time a hundred years. So they reappear every hundred years, see how far we've come in a hundred years, have the wisdom of the last 10 million years of seeing a day's worth of human history. Well, I mean, once, you know, we have pretty good data storage right now, we could load like a whole shit ton of knowledge into a bunch of hard drives, take a whole bunch of extras and just fly them around the earth real fast. And that could be someone's job. And I would totally sign up for that. I would go into the future. You need to bring the thing is, though, you would need to bring a whole crew. You would need a doctor, right? You would you need like two doctors Two computer people, you know, you probably need the four computer people, right? You would need some astronauts who could repair the shit. You would need, right? And the thing is, every time you came down, what you'd probably do is you would get, get all, all new technology, all new stuff. But the thing is, right, what if you go around and then you're going around looking at the Earth and the Earth is basically going in fast motion from your from your perspective, because you're right. So you're wa- basically watching the Earth and fast forward with your telescopes or whatever. So it's like Sim City. Right, exactly. Sim you don't want to be sitting up there, and then you just see nukes. You're like, damn it. Yeah, you just see the Earth just like turns brown, like freaking Space Battleship Yamato. You're like, fuck. <laughs> oh, you, what do I do now? You come back down. You're like, what the fuck did you guys do? The whole. So then you basically gave up your whole human life for that, and now is nothing. But at the same time, then what do you do? Now you know you escaped. So you basically have to bring some women's and some and some dudes, and you basically have to have the plan of okay. You know, if this doesn't, if if we see the earth turn to shit, we have to go down and and start again. You know, it's there's, like the insurance policy for the whole earth. There's always the fun time travel, like the girl who left through time. I didn't watch that yet. Oh, you didn't watch that? The same person did Summer Wars. I know. I can't believe you got to see that. Yeah, and tell me how many other million things I haven't seen. I don't. Well, Twelve Monkeys. Okay. You you didn't see Dark City still. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think we've talked enough about time travel. All right. That's cool. We'll kill it. See you next week, kids. It's it's killed. Mustn't kill time, boy. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Cat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night.